Can I start by acknowledging the traditional owners and thank you, Sean, very much for the uh, for the welcome to country. Uh, and if I could also acknowledge the elders, past and present, on the land that we're standing here, and and highlight the richness uh, that Aboriginal culture and heritage brings to all our communities in. Western Australia and from my perspective, particularly regional Western Australia. Uh, also to my ministerial colleagues, Mia Davies, uh, she's also Deputy Leader of the National Party and Minister for Water, uh, Sport and Recreation and Forestry. The Honourable Colin Holt here, uh, Minister for Racing and Gaming and Minister for Housing. Uh, my other parliamentary colleagues here in Vince Catania, who's uh, Parliamentary Secretary to Mia and to uh, Wendy Duncan, who's also Deputy Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, uh, to uh, uh, Marty Aldridge, uh, uh, member for the Agriculture Region, Jackie Boydell, uh, member for Mining and Pastoral, uh, Darren West here as well from the Opposition, and Mick Murray, the Shadow Minister for Agriculture. Good to have you here as well, Mick, and member for uh, Collie Preston. Uh, to uh, to uh, get it right, Paula Rogers as the Director of CEDA, and also following on from Liz Ritchie, and we had a fantastic time during the season with uh, Liz uh, over the last couple of years, and uh, Liz is absolutely right in a commentary here in saying uh, what a fantastic successful series, not only from regional Western Australia, but I hope for those that came from metropolitan Perth to visit the regions uh, to try and uh, recalibrate, hopefully, uh, some of your thinking. Also, the Director General of the Department of Regional Development, Ralph Addis, that's here. Uh, and I think I saw in the crowd uh, Hendy Cowan, a past Deputy Premier and past Leader of the National Party. Good to see you here as well, Hendy. And uh, all those that have been involved with the forum, uh, with these, uh, this series in one way or the other, uh, and uh, I'd like to welcome you and also thank you for the contribution that you made in uh, bringing uh, uh, this series uh, to life. Uh, as, as Liz said, uh, your capacity and uh, the speakers in particular that have brought uh, good quality presentations has been well received. And of course the development commissions, both the chairs and the CEOs of the nine regional development commissions are here. Uh, a very, very big group and it's fantastic to see the turnout today. I want to go through um, three uh, different agendas, I, I guess. In the first instance, why do we have regional development and why is regional development important? Then I want to talk a little bit about the series and the value that I think that has brought to the table from an organisation like CEDA. And then a little bit about some of the things that we are doing in regional Western Australia. Although we've got a lot to go, there are some, some seriously important uh, both projects and programs that are occurring, uh, which I think we should acknowledge at this point in time. So first of all, the reasons why we do regional development. I think they are threefold. I think they are one around equity, equity in uh, a number of senses, equity of access to infrastructure. Now that infrastructure can be social, it can be commercial, it can be uh, uh, buildings and so on and, and, and support infrastructure that support supply chains out to markets or it could be as simple as a recreation centre to support sporting facilities in some of our regional communities. So infrastructure is a key uh, investment resource that's needed in regional Western Australia to support the equity challenge that we have when we compare ourselves to metropolitan Perth. Access to services. Access to services is absolutely critical. And again, um, if you live in some of the more isolated parts of the state, that uh, service challenge can be significant. And uh, we've invested, for example, about a quarter of our Royalty to Regions resource directly into health uh, as, as one investment area, either directly or indirectly. So it's uh, not unsurprising that health is a big investment area to try and get a level of service in that sector commensurate with, uh, with metropolitan Perth. So services are a critical issue. Uh, also, uh, access to opportunity. And I guess the, the example I'll use here is probably the one that is our starkest contrast. And that's just that is that if you are an Aboriginal child born into one of our remote Aboriginal communities, and we have about 270 of these, uh, then, then your access to opportunity uh, is significantly restricted compared to uh, if you were born into one of the bigger regional centres or indeed if you were born uh, in metropolitan Perth. Huge, huge difference. So access to opportunity uh, for some of those more isolated places is a substantial issue. So equity is the first argument to uh, support an agenda for regional development in Western Australia. The second reason is to accommodate uh, our population growth. We're expected by 2050 to have 5.4 million people in Western Australia, so pretty substantial growth. Uh, why shouldn't regional Western Australia shoulder some of that load? Why shouldn't we take some pressure off the infrastructure challenge that we have here in metropolitan Perth? It's always easier to deliver services in a very compact way. If we've got everyone living in one spot, you don't have to have many pipelines, you don't have to have many power lines to make it all work easily much harder to happen in regional Western Australia. So finding uh, the agenda of saying, 
have regional Western Australia shoulder some of that load of population growth is important. So the growth is one thing, but I'll make an interesting point which came out of uh, Department of Planning's uh, forward thinking. Presently, if I've got the numbers right, about 78% of people live in regional Western, sorry, live in metropolitan Perth as a proportion of our population. That's predicted to grow up to 82%. So not only do we have population growth, but the share of that population uh, growing is, is being shouldered increasingly by metropolitan Perth. And uh, I, I highlight as, that, as one of our challenges, why haven't we got a network of vibrant regional centres that can be attractive to people shifting, setting up business, being prepared to bring up their families, more so than what we're seeing in terms of people's behaviour in our, in our planning predictors. And the, uh, the third point for, as to why we should have regional development, that is to unlock the economic potential of Western Australia. The regions are a significant contributor to our economy. Uh, if we get regional development right and we get uh, the full potential coming from regional Western Australia, all West Australians benefit from that, not just those living in regional Western Australia. So unlocking the economic potential, and many of our investments now are increasingly taking an eye to those things that we need to invest in, partnering up with the private sector in order to unlock that potential. Of course, the resources sector is a big driver. We're a big export state, but increasingly agriculture is a, is a huge future opportunity, and I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But also uh, tourism, uh, bringing innovative strategies to deal with some of those other challenges I talked about around energy, around service provision into regional Western Australia, uh, are some of our biggest opportunities that present. So equity, uh, uh, accommodating for our population growth and unlocking the economic potential uh, are good for all West Australians, not those that just live in the regions. We've made pretty big investments as a government since 2008, um, a strong focus on regional development, uh, backed up by a pretty significant fund in the Royalties to Regions program, 25% of mining and petroleum royalties. Uh, in recent years, that's been near on a billion dollars extra into regional WA. Really important fund to get right really important to target that investment and I guess that's a big theme of what we're talking about today, not just our investments but others that come to party with it, but government can stimulate those opportunities. So the investments have been twofold largely. Yes, there's been a lot of uh, uh, backfilling, if you like, on underinvestment over many, many years over successive governments, so yes, that's been a challenge, but increasingly we're being more strategic about it. Some of our biggest strategic investments have been uh, in the Ord East Kimberley project, again another one I'll talk about in a bit more depth, uh, in, the, in the Pilbara Cities program, and it was only last week I was up there, up there opening the new quarter development which Landcorp uh, built. Now we have uh, commercial office space in the main street of Caratha. Uh, if you stand in the middle of that, look at the Plago investments across the street, uh, you know, high rise buildings at the end of the main street. Up the other end we've now got a super clinic You've now got a space there for a, uh, an arts precinct also going up very soon. It's not hard to think about yourself as to being in a big uh, metropolitan city, and yet you're in Caratha, what effectively used to be uh, a, a men's work camp supporting a mining company. And now it's a genuine city of the north. So those investments have been uh, strategic and pretty substantial support from state government to make that happen. And also uh, things like the Bustleton Airport, not quite, not quite so big in terms of numbers, but investing in an airport in the southern part of regional Western Australia to allow it to take traffic from the eastern states, taking two and a half to three hours off the travel time from Perth down there, giving what is an iconic tourism destination in that southwest region, Margaret River, Bustleton, access to eastern states traffic directly is a huge opportunity. I noticed uh, Pip Close was in the room here today. Pip's the CEO of the Margaret River Bustleton Tourism Association and uh, they are leading the charge of developing capacity within the tourist sector down there so that when the airport opens up in 2018 when they walk off the plane to go into that region they'll have a good experience making sure that people are teaming up in the southwest to get the accommodation capacity the experiences uh, uh, all the all the tourism elements the pieces of the jigsaw that need to come together to make it work are starting to happen just from an investment uh, that we've done in building an airport so a, a tremendous uh, strategic investment, unlocking opportunity. But of course there's been a lot of uh, service related investments in the past. Uh, Royal Flying Doctor Service, supporting what is a fantastic service in regional areas. If you live in regional Western Australia now, wherever you are in the furthest points, Kununurra and Wyndham, you are within three hours of the best hospital that we have with the new uh, RFDS jet within three hours of the best hospital that we have. 
Uh, what, a, what a great investment. How can you sell that short as something that actually makes a difference in those people that live in those areas? Emergency telehealth. Uh, you would have seen on Today Tonight, two nights ago, uh, a young fella is um, young. He's young because he's probably my age. Uh, um, his name was Mick Murphy. Uh, Mick had a heart attack at Lanceland while he was fishing with his wife. Uh, he went into the local uh, health centre, which was a um, silver chain run facility. Uh, she had to manage that as quite a critical issue. They hooked up with a, a specialist emergency doctor in Perth that was able to prescribe a drug that she did not have the authority to inject into this person to save his life over an emergency telehealth facility. That's a Royalty to Regions investment in the region of WA. There's now 74 hospitals that have that emergency telehealth and it is saving lives. It gives the people at the other end confidence that they can deal with these very challenging issues uh, at the same time as making sure that uh, you know, what they're seeing is, is, not, is not a bad thing, but, uh, but perhaps normal and uh, we can get people back on their feet and out the door. So that emergency telehealth is investing in key services. Something as funding as mobile phone towers. Something as critical as mobile phone towers. We all take it for granted. You've probably got your tweets and stuff going right now. Uh, you don't think about the service too much sitting in this room. You go out to regional Western Australia, it's a very, very different, uh, very, very different challenge. We were the first state, state of Western Australia, to invest some resource in supporting Telstra to make their business case work to build towers where it wasn't commercial prudence to do so. In total, $85 million of funds. Uh, at the end of the program, coupled up with some black spot funding from the federal government now because they've been bought into the game, uh, we will have completed and built 266 new mobile phone towers in regional Western Australia. A huge enabler. Uh, the, there's 25 in the Kimberley. I was just reading some stats recently. There's 25 new mobile phone towers in the Kimberley that we built from this program. Uh, that has, has got a traffic going through of, it of a, thou uh, sorry, a million calls a month just through those 25 towers, 400 a month on triple O calls. So you just equate that to what difference it makes to people that are travelling in those areas. Uh, a huge difference. So yes, some big strategic investments, which is significant, but also uh, service investments to make the service support for those that live within the regions uh, important. Interesting that uh, since 2008, the regions of uh, the regional economy has grown by about a third, $22.5 billion. Now, notably um, strong support from the resource sector in achieving that, and, uh, and even though uh, it's come off a bit and there's certainly a transition in the economy, that growth is still substantial. There's an extra um, 47,000 houses or homes in regional Western Australia since 2008, an extra 57,000 uh, people working, people employed in regional Western Australia. So there has been growth. Uh, we'd like to think that we're at least in part supportive of that happening. So uh, on to the series, uh, the CETA series. Um, we, we really valued the relationship with CETA, a very, very competent, well-respected organisation uh, of, of national base, uh, coming together to say, let's have a series in regional Western Australia. And I pay tribute to the courage that CETA had to do that. Not easy. Yet it was one of the, with hard work and effort and a lot of support, uh, one of the most successful uh, series that you've had. All the ones I went to are either sold out or near on sold out. Uh, 1,600 participants uh, across two years. And I think uh, Liz said about 180 uh, high quality, high caliber speakers that were brought to the table to have the discussions that we actually want to have in regional Western Australia. And what was interesting about the last two years is at the same time we had the series, we were also uh, uh, transitioning and working through our blueprint process with the regional development commissions. Each of the nine commissions was charged with putting together a blueprint which identifies those things that unlock potential and identifies those things that can give us guidance to where we need to make investments or the private sector should invest to actually make a difference in their particular regions. So they were in various uh, stages of maturity. At the same time, we're having this discussion with an organisation like CEDA, bringing competent people to the table. So that enriched that process and certainly value added. And uh, we talked today about launching uh, the report. Fantastic to have uh, the independent assessment that CEDA brings to the table of what we're doing in regional Western Australia, and I welcome that. And I welcome the fact that you can pull out uh, five actions in this case uh, as a product of that, and thank you Deloitte for putting that together. Five actions that we can go away with and have a closer look at matching it up to the directions that we're trying to, uh, to run as a, a state government in regional Western Australia. So that uh, State of the Regions, Regional Development in Western Australia uh, launched today. You've got the book there. 
Um, have a close look at it. We, we see value in, in what's happened. We see value in bringing competent people to the table to discuss the challenges and the opportunities that present in regional Western Australia. And I have little doubt uh, that what's happened will value add, not only to the discussions, but to the outcomes that all of us can look back in a couple of decades and say, yeah, we actually made a difference in that time as to how we approach policy settings and investments as it applies to regional WA. So some of the, uh, some of the projects that we've been involved with, uh, some of the things that, that I think uh, uh, bear a bit more discussion uh, than, than just mentioning as a headline. One of those is um, the Season the Opportunity Initiative in agriculture. Agriculture has been identified in most of the Development Commission regions as a diversification opportunity. With the, with the transition that's happening in the economy, this is one of the opportunities that is here. A lot of the contemporary thinking has identified that uh, because we have so many people living to our north, uh, their, their changing purchasing habits, uh, dietary needs and so on, have positioned agriculture as being an opportunity. When we were talking about this policy setting, uh, whilst the discussion was there at an international level, there wasn't the actions. We didn't see the behaviour in the marketplace. In the last two years, we've seen substantial behaviour in the agriculture marketplace change. Significant West Australians, Gina Reinhart, Twiggy Forrest and Kerry Stokes are making significant investments in the agriculture sector. Right now, sitting on my desk, is about 18 pastoral leases looking for my signature to transfer uh, from three quarters of which are foreign investments, overseas investments, into those pastoral leases. Again, indicating something's happening in the marketplace which is actually showing out in a behavioural shift. I think we're seeing a step change in agriculture. So yes, it will have its natural volatilities, but it's a step change up, uh, and that's a good thing. And that's not going to come to us on a plate. We have to find a way to be able to take up that opportunity. That's what this initiative tries to drive. There's five identified areas that require uh, us to invest and the private sector to invest to support unlocking the full potential. One of those is understanding the asset, the land and water asset. Uh, Mia Davies is doing some great work in water for food. And you would have seen um, in today's West Australian, GoGo -Go Station uh, talked about um, having, in fact, uh, uh, Jimmy, uh, Ch Ch Jimmy Chandley, Sh Shandley is uh, the Aboriginal fella. He's on the next door station, but they've, uh, the local TOs, partnering up with GoGo uh, to look at a, a, a pathway through to freehold land. They need to know what water's under the ground. It's no good making investments like that without knowing the water's there. So we can de-risk that. So the Water for Food program has been a part of achieving that. So understanding the asset. Uh, also research and development. You know, productivity is flatlined a bit, uh, getting as much government investment or public sector investment as well as private into that space is challenging, uh, but an important space to operate. The next one is uh, pathways to market, efficient supply chains. What are the barriers? Is it, is it transport? Is it logistics? Is it the ports? Where are the natural barriers that we have to uh, open up to allow um, the pathways to market to be, to be opened up and, uh, and efficient? And also trade and investment, understanding the, uh, the overseas opportunities. Uh, getting and, and opening doors to investment here into West Australia, and I want to talk about one initiative that we're trying to do to help that. And also skills. Skills is the fifth one. Having the skill set to support the growth in the sector and the skills needed to drive uh, uh, productivity in Western Australia to capitalise on what's actually going on at an international level. The one I wanted to talk about was WA Open for Business. And I launched this at the forum we had up in, up in Geraldton. $20 million investment, having a shop front for international investment in the agri-food sector into Western Australia. Hopefully the office will be uh, open from the start of July. Uh, we, have a, we, we do it well in so many areas, including the resource sector. I'm not sure we do it well in the agribusiness space. So having a shop front where, where investment interests can go and have a face of government to talk to. Half of the small team will be involved on the, on the, the incoming investment interest and have connectivity to our trade offices overseas. The other half is about maturing up uh, uh, our businesses on our side to either take investment or to partner up. So playing a, a key role, not to do the job of business, but to try and make the links that are necessary in business to have those investments land. Because I would rather that the investments land and are successful than come here and, and, and run around the place and fail. So playing a proactive role. And many of these investment areas want to see government. They have some trust in government particularly Chinese investment and particularly investment from the Middle East. We don't play a role in foreign investment formally, it's a federal space, but we can play a role in having a shop front for that investment interest. So the season the opportunity, a range of initiatives, collectively they capture those themes about positioning Western Australia better in the agri-food space. Of course the Ordees Kimberley project is one of those other big ones. 
Um, from our perspective, a $322 million investment in a canal and a road is what it took from state. Coupled up with some social infrastructure investment from the federal government, and it's probably the last significant investment that happened in Western Australia and the regions where you got the federal and state government teamed up, and it was under Kevin Rudd. Half a billion dollars went up there. We've got Kimberley Agricultural Investments doing green fields development on what was effectively pastoral lease, having highly valued irrigation agriculture happening in the north of our state. That hadn't moved for 40 years. So suddenly that's happening. They've now got access to a pathway to freehold, provided they meet uh, um, development gates to get through to achieve that, giving them bankability, and also in the Knox Plain and also in Mantinia, which was released recently. So we've now released the full ord stage two. The next stage is either going to the Northern Territory in stage three, and that's up to them, and they're working on that, or into the Cockatoo Sands, which is up and off and out of the Ord Valley. Again, um, a, a significant opportunity that sits in that. The third area I want to quickly talk about is, uh, is uh, regional services uh, reform, uh, looking at the remote Aboriginal communities. I'm one of the ministers with Andrea Mitchell, uh, before it was Helen Morton that's been dealing with this, um, and I bought into that as the Regional Development Minister, because in the Kimberley Development Commission blueprint, it says that uh, Aboriginal development equals regional development. If we don't get that bit right, uh, if we don't unlock the, uh, the workforce potential that sit in the Aboriginal communities in the Kimberley, we're going to be holding back the economic and development opportunities that the Kimberley presents and aspires to. So buying into that, uh, pretty soon in, uh, in this month, later on this month, uh, you're going to see a, a roadmap from the WA government highlighting key issues, directions, some key investments and the challenge of where we go from here and it's got to be long term. If we're going to get a transformational shift, it's going to take a generation. So we're trying to pick the bits off that we can tackle and the bits that we can see are starting down that path uh, to get better outcomes for those that live in those very, very remote parts of Western Australia. Very, very important issue. The Southern Inland Health Initiative, I said I'd come back to that. Half billion dollar investment into the south of the state, uh, 300 million into capital improvements, but 200 million dollars into services. We now have 36 more doctors in the southern part of the state. Interestingly, uh, in regional WA, 55% of our GPs uh, are foreign trained, overseas trained. And I was with Wendy Duncan in Kalgoorlie yesterday launching uh, Ford to Fellowship, a funding support to have those doctors get their fellowship, which is what they need to get in order to be full independent service providers here. Um, and uh, and those, of those doctors that are coming in here, uh, before the Sci High investment, 36% uh, of them would stay for four years or more. Now over 70% are staying for four years or more. So there's more doctors plus they're staying longer, a good outcome. Five years ago, if you, present to a, if you presented in the evening to an emergency department, you would have 20% chance of having a doctor there. Now if you present, you've got 98% chance of having a doctor there if you present to ED in the evening. Fundamental shift in what is a core service for people making decisions to live in regional Western Australia. The, uh, the other big one was growing our south, a $600 million program for the four development commissions in the southwest. A couple of big investments. Uh, we talked about the Bustleton Airport, one that unlocks potential. The foreshore in Bunbury, the Kumbana Bay, the uh, Dolphin Discovery Centre, investments that uh, support what's already happening in Bunbury is uh, with the, uh, the Marlston uh, waterfront development, commensurate with a real you know, activation centre that you'd see in most of our big port cities, uh, happening now in Bunbury, giving that a lift, supporting private sector investment. Uh, Landcorp's doing a great uh, job of the Kumbana North development, bringing a Queensland developer in there, and that, that dirt's being moved around now, so action's happening. Again, activating an opportunity down there. Things like the, um, uh, the Augusta Marina, if you haven't seen that, it's worth having a look at. I was only talking to Brad Adams this morning, who's got ocean-grown abalone. Um, he's now looking at significant investments down there, partnering up with other investors to, to take what he has got, which is a premium product, into international markets, supported by a piece of infrastructure. That's all the state did. And again, activating opportunities down there. A little bit closer to home, Transform Peel. Uh, Landcorp's involved with this, a thousand hectares of industrial space in the part of the state that's got one of the highest youth unemployment levels. So bringing um, uh, an activation of an industrial area uh, close to key transport routes, close to metropolitan Perth, uh, allowing investments uh, to, to come into that site, generating uh, economy closer to where people live, making it easier to drive jobs in that region. So we've got the uh, a state level, we've got these blueprints, 
All the nine development commissions have got the, uh, the guidelines for where we should invest and where the private sector should invest. Independent sites doing that. What we haven't got is the overarching piece, the bit that talks at a state level about regional investment and talks about um, regional development from a state perspective. So that's why today we are launching the Regional Development Strategy 2016 to 2030, uh, 2025. Sits over the whole lot, very high level, talks about those investment areas that we need to invest in uh, to, in order to, to, to support uh, transformational change in regional Western Australia. We need to have the guiding lights to support us doing that. CEDAR has helped us with this regional series to, to make these documents and the blueprints robust, and I welcome that, and that independent perspective uh, is, uh, is encouraging and, uh, and we're strongly supportive of giving that sort of overarching view of how things should happen. So uh, we've, we're seeing some significant transformation in our economy. Uh, with that comes challenges, but also comes opportunities. Uh, we're in a position now to make some significant investments at a state level in the private sector, giving confidence to the marketplace in regional Western Australia because it is so important to all West Australians. Thank you very much and great to be a part of this today.